Good evening, everyone. And on behalf of the Canadian Remedial Action Plan Implementation Committee, thank you so much for joining our fifth science symposium. Due to the pandemic, we have turned this year's symposium into a virtual series of three information sessions. And tonight is our third and final session on fish and wildlife habitat creation and restoration within the St. Clair River area of concern. My name is April White and I will be your MC for this evening. I would like to acknowledge that the lands and the waters of the St. Clair River are part of the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg peoples, and it is the generosity of the Ojibwe, Dawa, and Potawatomi people that enables many here tonight to live, gather, and work on these lands and waters. On behalf of the Canadian Remedial Action Plan Implementation Committee, we want to acknowledge and honor the significant historical and contemporary contributions of our local First Nations, Amjanang, the meeting place by the rapid water, and Walpole Island, where the waters divide, and all of the original peoples of Turtle Island who have been living, sharing, and caring for the land, water, and resources since time immemorial. We will begin this evening's session with an opening prayer by Myrna Kiknosway from Walpole Island. Myrna, Jimmy Gwetch. <clears throat> The Kajadan and Dunjaba, Budawatami Odawa Nishnabi Kwanda, Musmi, Madewan. It's really good to be here, even though it is in virtual. I, I wish I could see all the wonderful faces. But right now, I would ask you just to take a few moments to center yourself and take a few moments to connect with yourself from the inside out so that we can all learn together and be at one. Just give me a few moments while I do the opening prayer. Abaju Mishomas Ishkote Makasan Kwan Dijnikaz Mond Odem Vikajanan and Dunjaba Udawadami Odawa Nishnabi Kwan Da Musvi Madewan Jimmy Gwachikajem Nado for this most beautiful day, for this most wonderful light. Jimmy Gwach for all those things we see and all those things we cannot see. To me, watch for the sky world, the earth plane, and the underground. All the Nokabasug and Mashomsug that have walked on this creation before us. All the ones who have left those teachings and those understandings of creation. I say, Chimigwetch, to you. Chimigwetch for the sun that travels across the sky during the day, the moon that travels across the sky during the night. Chimigwetch for our Earth Mother. The one who provides us with the water we drink, the air we breathe, and the food we eat. I say chimigwetch to her. And chimigwetch for all of those ones, all levels above the earth and all the levels below, that are following their original instructions. I say chimigwetch to the four colors of man, the yellow, the red, the black, and the white. I say chimigwetch. Chimigwetch for the trees and the grasses and the medicines and the herbs and the fruits and the vegetables. Chimigwetch for the water we drink, the air we breathe, and the food we eat. Chimigwetch for the thunders that have come back to us to help keep that balance and that harmony within this creation. I say Chimigwetch. Chimigwetch for the spiritual leaders around the world. Chimigwetch for all the songs, the ceremonies, the drums, the shakers, all of the teachings about how to live in harmony and balance with the natural laws of creation. I say chimigwetch to you. Chimigwetch for the four-legged, the two-legged, the winged ones that fly in the air, things that swim in the water and things that crawl in the earth. Chimigwetch to you. Chimigwetch for all those things we see and all those things we cannot see. Chimigwetch for that connection to all of creation so that we can be as one people, one heart, one body, one mind, one spirit, one soul, and one voice to take care of this creation, to take care of her, so that we will leave something for our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren and those generations that are coming behind us so that they can enjoy the beauty of this creation, the beauty of all things that are fully alive the water we drink, the air we breathe, the food we eat. I say chimigwetch to you. Watch over us and help us open up our hearts and our minds and our spirits to do your work this day. I say chimigwetch to you. Nikanagana, all my relations. Thank you. 
the hope. Thank you, Marina Miigwech. Before we get started, there are just a few housekeeping items to cover. Tonight, we're using the Zoom webinar platform and the event is going to be recorded and then posted on the AOC website, which is the same website you use to register for this event. To save on bandwidth and reduce background noise, microphones and video capability of participants will not be activated. This means that to ask a question at any time throughout the evening, you will need to quick click on the Q&A icon and type your question into the box. Only panelists will receive your question and your name is not required. Your question will be read out during the Q&A session by myself and I will direct the question to the appropriate panelists. And, and um, again, your name will not be read out. So don't be shy, ask as many questions as you, as you like. Uh, we are here to listen um, and share and all comments or questions are welcome. We will answer as many questions as we can and those that we don't get to, we will publish in a list and post it on the AOC website and apologize in advance if we don't get to your question. Following tonight's event, you will receive a follow-up survey by email. Kindly take a moment to complete it at your convenience um, as these suggestions and comments really do help us improve future sessions. I wanna take a minute to uh, thank the organizers of tonight's session, Naomi Williams, Donna Blue, Kathleen O'Brien, and Courtney Jackson. And to each of our presenters who have made this event possible and to each of you attending tonight, as a token of our appreciation for attending tonight, we will select uh, randomly three of the attendees and uh, you will receive a $15 gift card from Tim Hortons. The winners will be contacted by email on Friday. So let's get started. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, my name is April White and I work for Environment and Climate Change Canada. I am the co-chair of the Canadian Remedial Action Plan Implementation Committee, or CRIC for short, along with Ted Briggs from the Ontario Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. I also co-chair the Fish and Wildlife Habitat Restoration Subcommittee, and so I'm very happy to be your MC this evening and to showcase all the, all the wonderful habitat projects that have been implemented by the CRIC members and to share with you the results of our wetland monitoring. Recognizing that some may be wondering what I mean when I refer to the St. Clair River as an area of concern, I would provide a short presentation on what an area of concern is, why the St. Clair River was designated as one, and what's been done to address this designation. This overview will provide a bit of context for our future presentations tonight on Fish and Wildlife Habitat. So what is an area of concern? Well, it's an area, um, a specific geographic location within the Great Lakes Basin where severe environmental degradation to the aquatic environment occurred. There are 43 in total. Um, and these were identified under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement between Canada and the US. Of the 43 areas of concern, or AOCs for short, 12 are located wholly in Canada, 26 in the US, and five are bi binational, meaning they are a shared responsibility between the two countries. The binational AOCs are the five rivers that connect the Great Lakes, and the St. Clair River is one of them. This map shows the locations of the Canadian and binational areas of concern. You will note there are three green stars and these are AOCs where restoration goals have been met and the aquatic environment has been restored to a quality consistent of non-AOC areas around the Great Lakes. So the goal of the AOC program is to change the red dots, purple diamonds and yellow triangles into green stars, including the St. Clair River. Next slide. As you know, the discovery of oil led to significant industrial and municipal development in the Sarnia area and along the river. In the 1940s, numerous industrial facilities were constructed along both sides of the river, which really took a toll on the river's water quality and the aquatic environment. In 1987, recognizing the environmental impacts of decades of urban and industrial development, Along both sides of the river, the governments of Canada and the US identified the St. Clair River as one of the 43 areas of concern. Next slide. The St. Clair River stretches from the Blue Water Bridge down to Mitchell's Bay on Lake St. Clair, indicated in this kind of light green uh, color on the map to the right. 
Next slide. All AOCs have one or more of the 14 beneficial use impairments um, that need to be addressed. Each of these have been evaluated and given a status of either impaired, meaning they do not meet specific water quality um, objectives due to local sources of pollution or not impaired, meaning there's no evidence of adverse impacts due to local pollution sources. In some cases, there was insufficient data to make a definitive determination of a status of impaired or not. And so some beneficial use impairments were deemed to require further assessment, just simply meaning more information was needed in order to make a determination of the status. Next slide. To guide the restoration of impaired beneficial uses, each AOC developed an AOC-specific remedial action plan. The remedial action plan, or RAP for short, is really a cleanup plan, and in the St. Clair River area of concern, the implementation of the remedial action plan is coordinated by the Canadian Remedial Action Plan Implementation Committee, or CRIC for short. Next slide. The CRIC is a diverse committee with representatives from all levels of government, federal, provincial, and municipal, as well as uh, representatives from industry, conservation organizations, and Amjanong and Walpole Island First Nations, as well as the public. The CRIC members bring their expertise, resources, and enthusiasm to work together to implement the remedial action plan. Next slide. Since 1991, when the evaluation of the 14 beneficial use impairments were initially made, there's been significant progress as illustrated by these balance beams. On the left in 1991, you can see there were multiple impairments which are indicated by the red icons. Each of those represents a specific beneficial use impairment at that time. Fast forward to 2021 and the weight has shifted thanks to the efforts of the CRIC. We have significantly fewer impairments now, meaning the condition of the river has dramatically improved. Next slide. This is a table summarizing the current status of BUIs on the Canadian and the US side of the river. You will note uh, the dates that um, where the status of the beneficial use impairments have changed to a not impaired status. The ones outlined in, in red are those that remain impaired. On the Canadian side, we have four, and on the US side, there are two. On the Canadian side, we have one that still requires further assessment, and that pertains to fish and wildlife uh, populations. One of our remaining impairments, the one at the very bottom, loss of fish and wildlife habitat, is really the focus of our information session tonight. So tonight, uh, you will hear from our various partners how the CRIC is improving uh, fish and wildlife habitat within the AOC. We have two restoration goals. Well, we have several, but two of our restoration goals for this BUI include um, wetland quantity. So how much, wetland, how much wetland we have on the landscape and wetland quality. And again, the presentations tonight will walk you through our progress on those two restoration goals. Next slide. This is a sneak preview of some of the projects that, you're, that you'll hear about tonight uh, from our CRIC partners. Um, and really it's the efforts of our CRIC partners who have uh, led these restoration projects um, and really were um, instrumental in the CRIC being able to achieve the goals set out for um, fish and wildlife habitat within the St. Clair River AOC. I'd really like to acknowledge the support of the CRIC members that are presenting tonight, such as the St. Clair Region Conservation Authority, uh, Walpole Island, Rural Lampton, Lampton Stewardship Network, and of course, Environment Canada, who does the um, monitoring. So get comfortable, uh, relax, and we're going to take you on a virtual tour of several habitat creation and restoration projects that have occurred along the river. Next slide. At this time, while I introduce uh, the speakers for tonight, um, we'll launch a short poll. And so as that poll pops up on your screen, you can simply answer the questions and it just gives us some uh, feedback. 
So our first presenter is Erin Carroll. Erin is from Zinkler Region Conservation Authority, where she is the Director of Biology. Erin is also a longtime member of our Fish and Wildlife Habitat and Population Subcommittee and has been actively involved in the restoration of the river, not only through her job, but also as a volunteer member of the Friends of the St. Clair River. Following Erin, uh, and I'm not sure if Clint has joined the call. Um, we hope will be Clint Jacobs from Wapua Island. Clint is the coordinator of the Natural Heritage Center for Wapua Island, and he is the founder and president of the Wapua Island Land Trust, and has been instrumental in the coordination of many habitat restoration and creation projects, youth or outdoor education, and most recently, the construction of a greenhouse within Wapua Island. Clint is also an adjunct Indigenous scholar at the University of Windsor. Following Clint, we will have uh, Jake Lozon. Jake was born and raised in Chatham, Kent, and is currently lives, lives in Lambton County. Jake received his Fish and Wildlife Technology Diploma from Sir Sanford Fleming College in 1995. Jake is currently the Public Industrial Stewardship Land Manager for Ontario Native Escape and the Rural Lambton Stewardship Network. Jake. Jake specializes in upland habitat restoration and has been involved in coordinating and planting over 3,100 acres of land with native prairie trees and shrubs. Jake has been a long-term valued member of the Fish and Wildlife Habitat Subcommittee. And when he isn't parenting three boys or planting prairie, he is hunting or guiding. And our final presenter tonight is Joe Farino. Joe is a habitat ecologist with the Canadian Wildlife Service uh, within Environment and Climate Change Canada, where he leads the coordination of multiple Great Lakes coastal wetland monitoring programs, including wildlife and habitat monitoring within areas of concern and federally protected areas. So I'm going to pass the mic over to Erin to get started on our presentations this evening. Okay, good evening. So I was one of the many individuals that were involved in the restoration at Bowens Creek Habitat Management Area. So Bowens Creek is located about halfway down the St. Clair River between Courtright and Sombra in the St. Clair River Tributaries subwatershed. This map is from 2018 from the St. Clair Conservation Watershed Report Card. As you can see from the table and map, forest cover shown in light green, forest interior in dark green, and wetland cover red is below general guidelines for habitat conservation and restoration. The majority of the mapped forest and forest cover is located with, within Amgenong First Nation, just south of Sarnia. Mapped wetlands are clustered towards the middle of the map in Bickford Oak Woods wetland complex. Based on the last three watershed report cards for the 15 year period from 2001 to 2015, forest cover, forest interior, and forested riparian buffer has stayed the same or decreased in the St. Clair River tributary subwatershed. The amount of mapped wetland cover is about 1.5%. Bowens Creek Habitat Management Area is composed of two unconnected pieces of land known as Bowens North and Bowens South. The property is between Oil Springs Line and Bickford Line to the north and south, and between St. Clair Parkway and Highway 40 to the west and east. Bowens Creek was acquired by the County of Lambton from Monsanto Corporation during the 1990s. Since 2001, various plantings and habitat improvements have been carried out on these sizable parcels of land. In 2008, the St. Clair Region Conservation Authority signed an agreement with the County of Lambton to develop and manage properties like Bowens Creek Habitat Management Area. The St. Clair Region Conservation Authority planted more than 89,000 trees and 26 hectares of land in the Bowens Creek Habitat Management Area between 2001 and 2014. As well, one hectare of acorns were seeded and 1.25 hectares of shrubs were planted. 12 hectares of land was returned to wetland. In addition, Ontario Native Scape, or 
rural Lambton Stewardship Network, as they were known then, also planted five hectares of tall grass prairie along utility corridors. So here is the approx approximate location of the 2001 to 2005 plantings, as well as a breakdown of the work completed in that period. So 28 hectares of native tree planting, one hectare of direct seeding of acorns and walnuts, 1.25 hectares of wildlife shrub planting, and about 38,000 trees. So here is the location of the wetland restoration and planting established in 2011 to 2014 and a breakdown of the restoration over that time. So we have 24.3 hectares of native tree planting, 12.2 hectares of wetland creation, 1.4 hectares of native shrub planting, 4.9 hectares of tall grass prairie and 51,000 trees. The Bowens Creek South wetland was constructed in August 2011. The area was restored to wetland simply by breaking up existing field tile, along with some minimal contouring of the land. Trees were planted around wetlands, eventually returning the area to swamp as it was prior to cle clearing. So here is the 2010 aerial photo, and then here it is in 2014 for Bowen South restoration. And here is a pocket from the maturing wetland from last Tuesday. So I had the chance to walk out to the site. Here at Bowen's Creek North, you can see the wetlands were reestablished in naturally wet pockets. So that's the 2010 air photo before the wetlands were created and then the 2014 Google map photo. Here at Bowen's North wetlands, uh, here are the Bowen's North wetlands during construction and after construction in fall 2012 and May and August 2013. Here are the trees planted at Bowen's North and a couple of years later, and then that's them last Tuesday, so they're very tall now. So uh, Bowen's Creek Habitat Management Area is shown here with the dark blue polygons is really well situated for restoration because it's biologically connected to provincially significant habitat. This map shows the Bowens Creek catchment uh, outlined with a purple line. Green polygons show forest cover and red polygons show uh, the Bickford Oak Wood provincially significant uh, wetland complex. The purple polygons that I just, just appear uh, indicate the rough boundaries of the Clay Creek Woodland Regional Area of Natural and Scientific Interest. The yellow shading indicates the boundaries of the Bickford Oak Woods Conservation Reserve. Uh, that's about 300 hectares in size and Bickford Oak Woods provides interior forest habitat that's rare in Southern Ontario. The combined sloughs, swamps and marshes um, are, are very unique. So from all this, you can see that Bowens Creek Habitat Management Area is very well connected to a larger biological complex. Um, just going into a little more detail on what's right next door is the Bickford Oak Woods. It's the largest inland clay forest in the Carolinian life zone outside First Nations land and an excellent representation of clay plain forest with many significant species. The site contains good quality maple beech forest, oak hickory forest, buttonbush, and silver maple swamps. An astounding 130 bird species have been documented using this habitat, including the endangered cerulean warbler, uh, Reptiles and amphibians are common here. Larger mammals like beavers thrive. One of the things that Bickford Oak Woods Conservation Reserve is known for is uh, the swamp cottonwood. And it's the only known location in Canada. It was discovered by Jerry Waldron, John Ambrose and Lindsay Roger in 2002 while they were doing some inventory work. Uh, Spoonleaf moss, a threatened species, has also been documented at Bickford Oak Woods uh, Conservation Reserve. So because of this, uh, it's, it's excellent location, Bowen, Bowens Creek Habitat Management Area 
uh, nestled adjacent to Bickford Oak Woods and the Clay Creek Woodland Ansi, the biodiversity rebounded very quickly. So we've seen great egrets, red-tailed hawks, gray tree frogs, wild turkey, eastern garter snake, and many, many other species. I visited uh, there last Tuesday and I heard spring peepers and chorus frogs calling. I saw bull and green frog tadpoles and in total there's seven species of amphibians that have been documented on the property. Okay, so I, had, I did a little video just so that you could experience it yourself. Um, hopefully you can hear the sound. I just want to share with you that the beautiful spring sounds of an active wetland that we were able to create. So we also know all of us that Southern Ontario is under intense development pressure. Uh, this area is no different. In recent years, approximately 36 hectares of clearing has happened within the boundaries of the Bickford Oak Woods, PSW and ANSI. Uh, the restoration at Bowens Creek Habitat Management will take many years to achieve the conservation value of the area that was cleared. Um, since completing the restoration, additional work has been completed at Bowens Creek Habitat Management area to make sure that it's uh, protected for the long term. So right away, uh, biologists at St. Clair went out and delineated the wetland pockets and effective May 29th, 2017, the wetlands were added to the Bickford Oak Woods Provincially Significant Wetland Complex. As well, after thorough assessments conducted by Ontario Nature in 2022, Bowens Creek Habitat Management Area has attained conservation land status and now qual qualifies as protected area and will contribute to Canada's target of protecting 25% of lands and waters by 2025. So uh, this is just one project that we decided to highlight for you, but it's really astounding the work that we've done since 1995. It's a, there's a total of uh, 331 projects documented. Uh, those projects cover an area of uh, 1,114, sorry, and 34 hectares. Uh, these projects have been done by uh, all the partners uh, presenting tonight, so St. Clair, Ontario Native Skates, Ducks Unlimited Canada, and uh, many other conservation partners. And, and we couldn't have done this work as well without the support of uh, the Great Lakes Sustainability Fund. So that's it for me. So I just uh, thank you very much for inviting me tonight. Thank you, Erin. So again, if you have questions for Aaron, we just encourage you to use the chat function um, so that they'll come in to us. And then during uh, the, the Q&A uh, portion of the seminar, we'll read out uh, questions and direct them to, um, to Aaron. So we are uh, on time and our next presenter is uh, Clint Jacobs from Walpole Island. And I present yeah. Oh, you've got your presentation there. Clint, are you ready to go? Sure. <laughs> okay. I'll turn the mic right. over to you, Clint. All right. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> Bonjour, everyone. Really neat to um, hear all the good work that's happening in our traditional territory. So miigwech to all those um, folks that have been contributing to that. I'm going to chat a bit about um, a project that we had supported by Environment Canada um, April rights program um, and others, or you'll, you'll see it on, on many different partners. But anyhow, we're going to talk a bit about Swan Lake Marsh. You see the little red dot where it's located on, on the delta here at Walpole, the Kitchenon. Um, next. And this project was <clears throat> being supported to help so, <clears throat> contribute to outcomes that we're, we're all working towards to help improve St. Clair River area of concern. Um, you can see that the scope of the project there was to conduct baseline <clears throat> gathering of, of baseline data around fish and wildlife, plants and animals, um, 
gathering information, develop a wetland restoration plan for Swan Lake Marsh, as well as implement the plan to hopefully improve the ecological functions and biological diversity of that marsh. Next. So here's a aerial image of, of the Delta here. You can see Wallace to the right. Um, and the, per, the project site is pretty small. 171 acre marsh It's one of the um, oldest diked in marshes at, at Walpole Island. Um, and you can see how expansive the, the wetlands are across from east to west. Next. Because it was diked in for so long, it, it <clears throat> declined in its biodiversity over the decades. Um, and so part of the effort to help restore it, rehabilitate it, we spent time talking to our community, listening, listening, listening from as many people that have any sort of um, interaction, relationship, or, or work at Swan Lake Marsh, everything from people that might have trapped or fished, managed the clubs that were there, Swan Lake Marsh Club, or might have been guides. Um, yeah, anybody that had any sort of interaction, um, we spent a lot of time for months listening, and, and they came up with these the goals for us, <clears throat> and that was to, to can you continue that dialogue within the community, work towards en enhancing the the marshes functions, ecological functions, and, and enhance the wildlife populations there. <clears throat> they wanted us to take a look at the Phragmites, invasive species there, and then um, consider potential uses, as well as train community members to conduct environmental habitat and wildlife assessment and surveys, as well as bring youth there to help uh, connect them with elders, hunters, fishers, uh, to help them learn about wetlands, ethical hunting practices, survival techniques, our language and stories, cultural teachings, and all those things that relate to our people's connection to uh, marshes. Next. And you see in there in that last previous slide, this, this project required funds to make, to make things happen. Um, and you, you see that we had some initial supports from our own First Nations Economic Development Program, uh, Ducks Unlimited, um, Wildlife Habitat Canada, and I can't remember the last, the other one. Anyhow, there was four. We went to council once we spent time for much listening to the community, getting their input and ideas around what could be done with this marsh. And lots of different stories, they, things people told me this marsh that you're seeing right there um, used to be two thirds open water. And looking at that image there, that's not two thirds open water. So we had lots of work to do. Uh, we leased the marsh and that was what those four partners, they gave us funds to be able to lease the marsh for a 10 year period from 2009 to 19. We got a band council resolution to, to support that. And we, continued seeking funds you'll see as we go along next. So we're gonna take a look at that site before and after some of the work that we did. Next. So here's an image of the marsh, just kind of looking uh, across it. It was a pretty monogamous uh, dense stand of, of, of cattails. Um, and there was Phragmites all around the perimeter. And you can see there that you don't see a whole lot of water except for that channel there. So that was in 2010 when we first took this on. Next. Here's, we got up in the air and um, Janet McMath was really kind to help um, hang out the plane and take photos. Um, while I was in the back behind a window with a video camera. Um, but you can see that there's not a lot of water in that marsh other than inside the um, dike, and you can see the kind of discolored yellow. Um, that's the Phragmites that was at the site at the time. Next. So, like I said, that the community wanted us to kind of gather baseline information on what was there um, back in 2010, 29, 2009. Um, and so you can see my friend Carl Smith, um, he was hired on to help us kind of take this project and then take as far as we can go to see what we can do to implement everything that was recommended from the community. But we were out there on a regular basis um, in a canoes, 
uh, walking the dike as much as we could, um, surveying for everything from um, wildlife surveys, listening for for birds, for frogs, for um, you name it. Next. Uh, we we're even doing, uh, Naomi trained Carl on how to do um, soil or sediment sampling. So you see that ponar there dropping it into the bottom of the, the cut there and then pulling out the sediment. And Naomi helped to send that off to a lab to get it analyzed. Next. Um, <clears throat> in 2013, we even did a, a burn. Um, you can see that the top pictures where it started and in the bottom right corner where it's kind of finishing off. Next. We had a lot of different folks that were provided helping hands. <clears throat> we needed to kind of clear the vegetation that was past our, our shoulders in, in a lot of places. Um, and so we needed some heavy duty brush cutters and, and weed whips and you name it. Um, but you can see here some of the folks that, that helped um, clear the veg vegetation so we could take a look at what the condition of that marsh or at least the dikes were at the time. Next. So all this initial baseline uh, data gathering was helping us to inform a restoration plan, a management plan for the marsh. Um, so we continued gathering that information and we were able to kind of slowly develop this restoration plan. Next. We needed to understand what the condition of the dike was. So we got some additional supports from a program called CORDA, the Canada-Ontario Resource Development Agreement. Um, they were able to provide funding for the, the gentleman that you see there, uh, some of the equipment that we needed, some of the heavy duty um, cutters and you name it to be able to get across uh, the dike and, and see what the condition of it was next. We also had some folks from our community to help stabilize that dark be uh, dike because in some spots it was um, only two feet wide. So Kenner's there was helping and him and Ernie were out there um, stabilizing the dike and yet you can see that that image there. Yep, go ahead, you can continue. So you can see all around the, the perimeter of the, the marsh along the river side, it's, that's the clay that you can see it's kind of grayish tone. So we're able to pull some uh, sediment and build up that dike back in 2014. Next. We also had some school groups from the island, kids come out and help us plant. We got some supports through the, the funding programs, the Environment Climate Change Canada's programs um, and others. Um, and they helped, we brought kids out from the island school and they planted some trees like swamp white, um, oak and other um, species that, that can stand having their feet wet. Um, so that was really nice to have their help. Next. Um, and you can see there, there's Kenner's there out, out in the marsh are creating uh, ponds and, uh, and, and connecting channels. Next. We had to drain the marsh, pull, draw the water down. So we, we purchased a uh, portable flood pump that connected to uh, a tractor and Carl and others were there to help uh, draw that water down so that the contractors can get into the marsh without uh, burying their excavators. Next. You see there that now that the water is kind of drawn down, we have some contractors um, <clears throat> from the mainland. We had. Um, Jake's dad, um, Bob Lozon, helped uh, him and um, uh, one of his friends helped to uh, excavate some ponds and other things there. Next. And there's just more images of that work. We're inspecting the, the results of some of the excavation work. Continue, next. Um, right away, wildlife start popping in. Next. And you see water starting to fill. Um, the work was still continuing. So, oh yeah, there is Bob and Norm. So we went to them. Thank you for them for helping to excavate these ponds there and connecting channels next. And some more work. And this, yeah, a lot of work. It was just um, 
creating these ponds there. So next slide. And <clears throat> we spent some time asking the community, where should these ponds go? And, and then they kind of drew on maps for us. And so we, we um, kind of based off of what they were recommending and what where things used to be, different ponds. So you can see we, um, Bob and, and others helped put in um, a, a floodway or um, fish passage um, culvert structure that connected to the Snai River and allowed water to come into the marsh with a gated um, ends next. So this is after, this is uh, towards the end of our project. This is what the, the marsh was starting to look like. You can see the fishways too that connected into uh, a 16 acre pond on the bo bottom uh, left and then the other connecting channels next. See more of that ponds allow for wildlife and others to uh, expand. Next. Um, and here's some of the results of that, um, of the project. Next slide. We had some folks from the Rural Ontario Museum and uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada come in back in 2013 when we were initially doing our baseline gathering. At the time, you can see those are only that's the diversity of fish that we had. We had um, uh, mostly mud minnows, which are fish that can survive in mud. So it, it kind of um, give us a, a snapshot of, of how that wetland was actually not in the best health. Um, but we were, were able to find in the, in the uh, existing channel at the time, the fish that you see there, the grass prickle and then some a bass and some others. Next, but there wasn't a whole lot of diversity there. So we were able to um, prepare a small report um, on what was found in the connecting channels or within the existing dike. Next, um, we had some volunteers and others um, that we contracted to come in and study the plants and give us a, a list of what, was, what they found. Next. Might, might not have known what they were seeing, but we had give them cameras and, and um, uh, notepads and other stuff. And they basically just took pictures as they were canoeing along in the, in the marsh and brought back their photos. And we had, um, we were able to identify some of the stuff. Um, and we called upon others to help us identify those species that we couldn't. Next. And there are some of the things that uh, the kids were and others were, were taking pictures of. You can see, uh, different turtles, um, uh, frogs and water snakes, geese next. So this was initially what was in the marsh, just continuing along, gathering this baseline information. And then back in 2014, we hired some community members as well as uh, DFO, um, Fish and Resources Canada come and helped us study, um, and do a fish assessment, a habitat assessment within the marsh. They're looking for turtles and fish and other things there. Next. And they didn't just look in the marsh, they also looked outside because we were planning on connecting the marsh through that fishway, allowing for species to be able to enter. And we wanted to know what was on the surrounding that marsh, what type of uh, fish and wildlife were there. So they were also doing um, sediment sampling and, and uh, water quality uh, sampling. Next. Um, we were sharing information and this happened all throughout the project. We were putting information out in the community through our newsletter, but also through flyers, um, radio programs. Um, anytime we were set up at any type of community event, whether it was a powwow or a fall fair or you name it, some sort of open house next. Just acknowledging different groups, including this was uh, Western University. They kind of come on and help us do some work at that uh, site back in 2014. They uh, connected with some elders and others in the community to learn about our home, but they also um, reciprocated their, that learning by, by helping uh, with our project at Swan Lake Marsh. Next. Um, so over the, the beginning of the, the project from 2012 to 2014, you see here's a list of, of different wildlife that we were able to 
together through volunteers who um, youth that helped us with the project through um, experts that we might have contracted. So that was a interesting list of, of species. Next. Um, and as part of that 16 acre pond that we um, had excavated, we continue um, studying that, that pond in particular. Um, and then you see the list of different species that are, are, are kind of coming into the, uh, the marsh itself uh, once we got the fishways um, installed. So there was uh, an increase of diversity, um, definitely an increase in numbers of, of different species that we're finding from, um, from compared to when we started that project. Next. And here's some other outcomes. Some of the partners I've been involved, just sharing. Uh, this is the Friends of the St. Clair River um, that, that donated to support, help our uh, project get, get, uh, get going, as well as we had Ducks Unlimited Canada um, supporting that initially to get our project off, off on, onto its feet and then uh, moving forward. Next. Um, and over the course, we were able to document and, and prepare this uh, restoration and management plan that we used to um, move forward with that. Next. I want to say Jimmy West to all the partners that you see there, um, Environment Climate Exchange Canada, Fish and Gnosis Canada, uh, Friends of the St. Clair, Ducks Unlimited. We even got some funds from the U.S. National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Uh, Toronto Zoo and their Turtle Island Conservation, Western Centennial College, uh, Wapala Land Trust, Wildlife Habitat Canada, Corda, Enbridge, uh, the province of Ontario through some of their uh, programs, uh, and so on. Miigwech. Next. Uh, some interesting facts that we learned through this initiative. Next. Um, we're sharing a lot of information through our radio program. Uh, newsletters, next. Um, hearing from our community, but also sharing back what, we're, what we were learning um, through our ecosystem circles, next. Um, other community events that we hosted and, and just to share information, but also to spend time listening and gathering information from members in the community, next. Mm -hmm. Uh, setting, setting up at our open houses just to kind of keep the community informed and in the loop of what's going on. Next. Um, as well as trying to put out as much information through our, our print uh, newsletter um, as often as we, as we could and to acknowledge the people that were supporting our, our project, whether they were uh, helping uh, assess fish populations or, or um, helping to uh, look at different things like, like water quality or whatever it might have been. Next. Again, sharing at different community events. This was at the WIFN open house. It's similar to what was held today. Next. Um, and other events, not just here in the community, but uh, elsewhere. We had open houses for the center that we, um, back in 2015, um, outdoor event. You see the, the one in the below is an info session that we had in the spring of 2015, uh, use up the whole space of the arena. Uh, upper corner is up what Chip was at attempts. We were invited to share information in their community about some of the work that we're doing. Next. Um, and other events here, you can see the uh, sharing information about uh, the project um, at a powwow. Um, again, looking for input from community. Next. Um, here's probably a solstice celebration, set up a tent and just uh, having displays and talking to people again. Next. Thank you so much. Before I wrap up, I just oh. wanted to um, make a couple little statements. Um, I hope I have a little bit of time, April. Um, um, uh, 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 like um, a minute or so, will that be That's okay? That's all I need. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So that, that project kind of is wrapped up at to this point as far as um, what we're doing. I want to thank all those that contributed to helping that uh, 
to be successful. We still want to continue um, looking at uh, the what type of wildlife are using uh, using the space. So we we're partnering with the uh, University of Windsor and the Healthy Headwaters Lab to um, conduct uh, wildlife surveys and things going forward. So we'll be doing that over the uh, the next little bit. Um, but I also want to um, encourage folks that are listening and participating. There's some really neat stuff that needs to happen in our community, and it is happening in our community. Um, we have a language immersion program that's that's um, taking our children out to uh, our marshes and getting our kids acquainted um, through not only um, seeing diversity, but but learning through our language. And so I encourage you to reach out to uh, Minivijgat. Um, he's leading that program uh, for our community here, the um, Kijunan, um Language Immersion uh, School. Um, so it's really nice to see how they're they're um, getting our kids connected to to our home and to our, our habitats uh, and the species, and seeing that they have responsibilities um, into the future. So if there's any ways that you can support them, whether it's through funding or through volunteering or taking kids out and encourage you to do so. Um, there's also other things like Alyssa Sands is putting on uh, a land-based uh, learning, um, taking kids out. They were just out here at the point uh, a couple of weeks ago doing uh, deer skin height, um, tanning and other things. So I really encourage you to support things that are happening, the grassroots groups that are, 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 are don't, may not necessarily have a lot of funding to make things happen, but they're doing a lot of uh, cool things, especially um, bringing and connecting our kids to the land, but also to their elders and others in the community. And I wanna make just one last plug. Um, I would really love for us going forward to, um, it's happening in other places like in New Zealand, but for us to look at the St. Clair River and take the lead in this region here to um, push for laws to give it personhood. Um, and encourage you to look that up. We'll share some things in our next newsletter, but that's one of the things I love for us to kind of do to help um, St. Clair River really heal. We really need to step up and, and uh, use as many tools as we can that are our, at our disposals. And it doesn't have to be just what's happening in Canada. It can be what's happening across the world. So there's others that are, are doing some really cool and interesting work. So um, I'm looking forward to trying to connect and see what we can do to, uh, to um, help the St. Clair River uh, with that personhood legislation. Miigwech. Thanks so much, Clint. Thank you for that. And our, I'm just rolling into the next presentation, which is uh, Jake from Rural Lambton Stewardship Network. I've just noticed there's um, there's still uh, some time for folks to uh, generate some questions for the panelists. We will have some time for questions at the end. Take it away, Jake. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, Jake Lowe's on here. Um, I do have a bit of a cough, so I'm going to apologize in advance if I cough a little bit. Um, so next slide. Um, we were part of the Ministry of Natural Resources, the Rural Lambton Stewardship was from 94 till 2013. And then the Ontario Stewardship Organization, the province uh, dismantled and we became a not-for-profit in 2013. So our volunteer uh, Council members became board of directors for a not-for-profit. Uh, we're located in Wallaceburg, and we do manage one of the largest tall grass prairie programs in the province with uh, close to 200 acres of seed production. That's about 50 native flowers and five native grasses. Next. Uh, another part of our program is wetland creation. And I've been part, um, I was the St. Clair River Habitats Project Coordinator for many years, working with April, and uh, we received uh, uh, Glyphs of Great Lakes Sustainability funding, funding money to do wetland restoration. Um, so this slide here kind of indicates where we focus some of our uh, wetland projects. And these projects wouldn't happen without obviously funders and partnerships and just getting to know the landowner, uh, getting trust from the landowner. Um, so, like I said, these are 1A, and there was a 1B section of area of concern back in the day, but I didn't include those. Next. So, I'm going to talk about pretty much um, these seven projects. Um, and uh, the majority of these projects, other than um, 
Branton Cundick Park and Swan Lake. Um, my grandfather trapped and my father trapped and they both were guides and I trapped and I was a guide too. So I got a lot of history with these projects. So it was kind of neat as I got older that I have a, a career that I can go back and help rehabilitate these projects. Uh, next. So the first project is located just south of Mitchell's Bay. It's called Bay Lodge. It's owned by the King family, uh, King Grain. Um, and it's uh, 160 acres of prime habitat, close to wetland, uh, two kilometers of shoreline. And like every other coastal wetland, it was heavily degraded with uh, invasive Phragmites. Next. Uh, here's a good picture um, of Bay Lodge before any restoration work occurred. Um, Clint pretty much talked about all the work that's involved in just even starting a project. Um, so I won't get into that, but on our end uh, to start a project just like this, obviously you need partners, you need the landowner commitment and you need funding. And then from there you can get your permits and uh, you get a, uh, a game plan and away you go. Next. Um, so this project occurred in 2012 and 13 when we had extremely low water um, that uh, allowed us to obviously go out onto the shoreline with heavy equipment and um, excavate some wetland. So this is a picture of 2012. Next. <clears throat> so the seven projects that I'm going to talk about, pretty much the same mechanics and methods occurred. Um, we went in in the fall and we sprayed Phragmites. Uh, we have um, we have an Argo unit and we hired a, an outside contractor to help us to eradicate the Phragmites in the fall first. And then we uh, took advantage of the low water and brought in excavators and uh, excavated some low lying areas. My father said when he was a kid that uh, there was ponds in the same spot where we were excavating ponds. So it was kind of neat to um, bring that all back. You can see how it's all choppy on the bottom of the <clears throat> of the wetland. We don't make um, we when we dig a pond, we don't typically just dig a, a golf course pond. We dig ponds with littoral zones because every littoral zone will hold different types of aquatic vegetation, different amphibians, different reptiles. So it's not the prettiest looking pond, but when it fills up with water, it's gorgeous. Uh, next. Uh, this was a, I don't know if the, the date is on there, but this was before the project occurred. And then the bottom photo is after the project occurred and it's just on the, on the uh, lake side. Uh, next. So this is uh, some drone footage that we had. Uh, water levels, obviously everybody knows have risen in the last few years. So, um, the ponds are doing extremely well, put it that way. Uh, the Phragmites, with the high water, it has just about disappeared. And uh, as of this year, the water has receded and the ponds look great. And Phragmite uh, is not there. There's a lot of cattails, lily pads, arrowheads growing. So uh, it's going to be a pretty interesting summer. Next. <clears throat> so this was a marsh that. Um, we used to actually manage my father and I, dad more so, uh, in the early 80s and late 70s. It was owned by Dick Ransom, uh, who owned Hickory Farms. He'd come to our house at Christmas time and bring all the Hickory Farms boxes of food. And uh, anyway, uh, it's a 67 acre marsh and it needed a lot of TLC, uh, just like uh, Swan Lake. It was um, heavily infested with invasive Phragmites and it needed some open water. So, um, uh, what's his name? Connors purchased the marsh in 2012, Wayne Connors, and uh, he wanted to work with us to bring it back to the way it was back in the 70s before Phragmites existed in our area. Next. So this is a great example, um, a great photo of what it looked like in 2015. Um, it's pretty much the same photo you will, you will see from just about any coastal wetland in 2015. Uh, next. Uh, that's one of my guys um, spraying frag in the fall. So um, <clears throat> this is a, a multi-year initiative. 
you're not going to kill everything the first year. So um, second year, there's half. And the third year, there's a quarter. And the fourth year, it's pretty much all gone. But um, when you target an area, it really does work well. Next. This is just a photo that I took when I was in the Argo. Um, you're pretty much blind as you're driving it. Next. So this, this project, along with a couple other ones, uh, we rolled all the frag. Um, and we like to roll the frag because it creates a, a safer burning environment when, you, um, when you're when you conducting a prescribed burn. And uh, it gives better fuel load on the, on the soil. So you get better coverage when you burn it. <clears throat> Next. And then sometimes there's a few obstacles. Like this one, we had to pull the uh, Argo unit out with another Argo unit because there is a lot of debris and what have you from um, logs and, you know, over the years that you can't see. Next. Uh, so this is still the Connors Marsh. Um, so we created a access with a culvert to get into the marsh so that way we could lower the water before the burn. Um, we were actually doing the excavation of the wetlands while we were doing this prescribed burn. Next. And above is before and below is in 2016. And um, this marsh has re recently been uh, purchased by another family uh, from Chatham and they are long-term uh, naturalists and it is not going anywhere. Um, it looks great, and they're taking very good care of it. So uh, it's it's a great success story. Uh, next, uh, there's a photo of um, of the ponds after. You can see there's still quite a bit of Phragmites in there, but this was done right after uh, the burn and um, the following year. So we burned this property. Actually, we just burned it yesterday, but we've burned this property three other times since 2015. Uh, next. Um, so this is Mud Creek Club. It's a, a very large marsh. Um, when I was little, it was 1,200 acres. I remember walking around the dikes. And, um, and then uh, it was owned by Henry Ford. And uh, Henry Ford sold uh, Mud Creek Club to a, a family in Chatham. And uh, unfortunately, quite a few acres were drained i think 800 acres were drained uh in the late 70s um it is zoned agriculture which is a whole other story that um and a question somebody could ask once something is zoned agriculture um unfortunately some of these properties have been drained and farmed uh, next so this is mud creek club this is called the pintail marsh um, this is actually photo is taken from Bass Haven and looking straight out, you can see Martin Islands there. And this is right along the coast, right adjacent to the Connor Marsh, which we just saw. Next. <clears throat> so you can see the Connor Marsh on the right hand side there. And then uh, uh, the coastal wetland where Mud Creek Club or Pintel is, it, um, it's filled right in. There's no ponds, there's no anything there. It was just solid uh, Phragmites and uh, a few cattails sprinkled here and there. Next. Uh, same as the Bay Lodge, we actually went in with two excavators on this property and um, <clears throat> we moved all the spoil. We dug a bunch of ponds and we moved all the spoil. There was higher ground because we were working in the floodplain. Uh, so you have to get a permit for that. And uh, we created a whole bunch of ponds in about 2012, 2013. We did this in the winter time when everything was froze and the water levels, while there wasn't any water there, had receded um, five, 600 yards out. Uh, next. So this is another photo of, um, this actually is right in Lake St. Clair. So um, that's a great photo of the literal zones that I was talking about. Uh, next. <coughs> Excuse me. And then, um, once the ponds were that's actually a pond right there that we had created uh, we did a prescribed burn shortly after just to clean the area up and see what was there and uh, it was all sprayed prior uh, next and there's another prescribed burn so that's actually 
that photo there was taken on the Connors Dyke uh, with a looks like an east wind and it blew across, which carried very nice into uh, the Mud Creek Pintail Marsh and cleared everything off quite nice. And uh, today the water's up high and there's hardly any frag there actually because of the high water. Uh, next. And then that was a drone uh, footage that we took. <clears throat> so this was taken right above Connors Marsh, looking over Mud Creek. Uh, to your left, that line of trees going out, that's called the Rankin, the Rankin Creek, that's Bass Haven. And then the trees way out in the lake, to the right, that's all Martin Islands. And to the right of that is all St. Anne's Island, part of Walpool. Uh, next. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's a, a before and an after. The top is obviously is before. Uh, along with Connors, you can see, and then below you can see uh, the different ponds that were created and the access channels, as well as the coastal wetland uh, ponds. Uh, next. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, this is the Cadot Rex Club. This is actually just south of the two properties that you just looked at. Um, this, was, um, this was a Ducks Limited project back in the early 80s. And there were fishways, actually, these are called fishways, these little um, channels that was actually uh, dug in the, in the 80s. And uh, because of low water and high water, then low water again, it pretty much sediment came in and filled everything in. So what we did was we went in and we opened up all those small channels. Um, I'm going to say about 2015 or 16. Uh, it was a tremendous amount of work. The, the, the upcoming slides will show that. Uh, next. So like the other properties, this is what it looked like prior. Um, just dense monoculture of Phragmites. Um, not good for habitat, not really good for anything. Uh, next. Uh, so this is a 50 acre property. <clears throat> so we went in and like I said, we created these fishways. We opened everything up. Uh, we uh, reinforced the uh, berms and the dikes between the fishways. Um, all the Phragmites on the property was uh, treated in the fall before excavation. Uh, next. And then we work with, <coughs> excuse me, um, we work with Chatham Kent and um, we, we received some funding. So we put in a nature trail uh, and the nature trail, anybody can use it, goes from Mitchell's Bay right along the Arta Drain uh, all the way into uh, the Cadot. Um, wetland and the Kadat family um, have welcomed the public to go in there and uh, do bird watching or what have you. So it's uh, your jog or bike, it's been heavily used by the public. Uh, next. Oh, there you go. Uh, it's a 1.8 kilometer walking trail. So there is signage. <clears throat> if you go to Mitchell's Bay, uh, you pretty much got to go to the marina. You'll see that's the start point. Or if you go to this is Lewis Line, uh, that road at the south, at the bottom of the page. Um, there's the dead end. You can park there, and then there's access into the property. That's actually a great drone footage of um, the after wetland with all the open water, and um, it's a great property. And there's native uh, prairie and flowers planted all over the place. There's pollinators everywhere. Uh, next, <coughs> excuse me. So that's just a photo of uh, when, it, when it was completed. Next. Uh, with, our, with help from our friends at Amjanong, they grew plugs for us, native flowers and grasses. And um, we actually had the 17 year old MNR stewardship rangers come out and help us plug plant the site. Uh, next. Uh, we, we put up nesting structures. That's two of the guys that work with us, Rob and Ian. Um, <clears throat> that's a screech owl that he's holding in a wood duck box. But um, yeah, we have hen nests and we have uh, wood duck boxes all over the place and we clean them out all the time. Next. <clears throat> and then uh, I put this slide on here because every coastal wetland that we've done, we create snake hibernaculus and uh, habitat clusters. Um, so as you can see in the bottom, uh, debris, <coughs> uh, rocks and pallets and what have you, we dig a hole and pretty much cover it up and there's pipes and what have you that stick out of it for, uh, snakes to hibernate in as well as, um, 
we create uh, sunbathing areas for turtles and snakes as well. So we'll put logs and stumps on the edge of the, of the wetlands. Uh, next. Uh, <coughs> this is the, um, the Grifor property, which is right across the SNI uh, from uh, Swan Lake. Um, and we pretty much copied what Swan Lake did other than the fish ways. Um, this at one time was a very active uh, wetland. It didn't have Phragmites when I was a kid. And then it, um, it just plugged right up with frag. So we went in and uh, uh, cleaned everything out and opened up the fishways just like we did with the Rex Club. And to this day, it looks phenomenal. Um, there's been lots of fish studies there. Joe can talk about that uh, next. That's one thing that Ontario Natescape and Rural Lampton Stewardship, we don't do a lot of or any is sampling or um, post monitoring because we're so busy doing everything else that uh, we we look forward to the experts doing that and providing us providing us with um, what's there and how it's acting and what have you. Uh, next, there's a great photo. Looks like the other ones of the Grief Four property before. Uh, next, and then there's a drone footage after. You can see a little bit of Swan Lake on the top left corner there. Um, so yeah, it's. Um, great connectivity for waterfowl to go back and forth and <clears throat> there's great access for uh, northern pike and different types of fish species too in the grief for property uh, next so um this is branton kundig park it is north of sombra no uh, yeah north of sombra i live in port lambton so it's actually not too far from me <laughs> it's owned by the st Clair township uh, next so this property was uh, just talking with the locals, um, uh, it was abundant with button bush back in the 50s. Uh, it flash flooded all the time. It hold, held a little bit of water, and it was uh, always stocked with northern pike that would go in there and spawn. And uh, over the last 30 plus years, it pretty much was just a um, an open drain into the St. Clair River. Uh, didn't hold water, never had any fish, and uh, it was being mowed by the township because it is a park. So uh, we approached the township as well as uh, our good friend, Daryl Randall with Ducks Limited. And uh, it, this project took a little while because of DFO and uh, different permits because we, it was full access to the river, but you'll see in the next couple slides, next. <clears throat> so there is the access to the St. Clair River. Uh, when we dug it, you can see in the top left, it was just plugged right up. It was full of debris and tires and just um, junk that people had tossed over the side, I guess. And then the low water didn't help either. So we cleaned that up. And then uh, my good friends with the St. Clair River Trail, um, they created a nice long trail that goes pretty much from Wallaceburg to Sarnia now. Uh, they needed a bridge. So we put a bridge there with funding support from uh, St. Clair River Trails and other organizations. And then, um, yeah, so we opened it right up so fish could actually access the wetlands. Uh, next. <clears throat> so that's just some uh, uh, digging before. Uh, there was uh, 72, 22 ton trucks of dirt that were brought to Ontario Power Generation <clears throat> and they were placed on the coal landfill. They needed the dirt and we needed to get rid of it. So it was a great partnership. Uh, next, uh, there's another a pretty awesome photo. Um, it was a very long wetland. Um, it wasn't dug that deep. Uh, the deepest spot might be two meters. We don't usually dig uh, fish ponds too often. And, um, and you gotta remember that the deeper you go, the bigger the budget. So <clears throat> we, um, we did a lot of liberal zones and we put in a few deep pockets just for the fish. Uh, for the pike spawning in the springtime, but we didn't want the pike staying there all year. Obviously, they're going to spawn and then uh, go back to the river. Uh, next. Uh, so that's one of our guys with our Truex specialized seed drill. Uh, we drill seeded it with native flowers and grasses shortly after wetland was done. Uh, next. Um, that's Daryl and myself, and uh, I don't know who that is, Norm. Um, so yeah, we um, just putting in some gabion rock and uh, getting ready for the wetland to fill up naturally from Mother Nature. Uh, next. 
and uh, there's a lovely photo of the after effect. It was nice that I was speaking with uh, Aaron from St. Clair region earlier and uh, they do a lot of fish monitoring and she did say this is uh, one site that I think they've seen more pike than any other site in the St. Clair River. So it is working. Fish are going underneath the road and spawning and then uh, going back. So that's a great success story. And then the township, they, they mow a trail. You can see it on the right, um, just for the public. And um, so you don't have ticks on yourself when you're walking through there and what have you. And uh, <clears throat> I, I like walking through there because it's, it's like symphony grass. It's so loud with pollinators and different types of bugs and uh, you got almost got to speak up and the traffic from the road is it's it pretty much disappears when you're walking through this uh, next oh that's great thanks jake Thank thanks jake um so as jake was mentioning um you know this is a lot of our habitat projects this isn't even all of them this is just some of the larger projects that have been done within the aoc and now i'm going to turn it over to joe Farino, who is um our ecologist with uh, the canadian wildlife service who does the monitoring of these wetlands and of course we can't monitor everything but uh i'll turn it over to joe to explain um and again, if you have questions, uh, this is the time to do it. And following Joe's presentation, we'll have a few minutes for uh, for questions. Take it away, Joe. Thanks, April. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. I'm uh, going to talk to you about some of the monitoring work we've done uh, in the St. Clair River area of concern over the last number of years. I've uh, been with the Canadian Wildlife Service for I guess I started about 10 years ago now, and I do this because I love wetlands. So I'm excited to share that with you guys. Next slide. So yeah, the Canadian Wildlife Service surveys many coastal wetlands along the lower Great Lakes, ranging from Kingston on the east end of Lake Ontario to the Huron Erie Corridor, which obviously includes the St. Clair River, Lake St. Clair, and the Detroit River. Uh, next slide. And one of the reasons we do this work is to be able to report on beneficial use impairments or BUIs for areas of concern. Uh, those BUIs are a common set of impairments uh, that were created by the International Joint Commission to describe changes in the chemical, physical, or biological integrity of the Great Lakes. Uh, so those BUIs, they cover a wide range of environmental and ecological concerns, and they aim to include different stakeholders in the delisting process. Next slide. For the St. Clair River AOC, uh, the BUI I'm going to talk about today is uh, BUI 14, which is Loss of Fish and Wildlife Habitat, which is currently designated as impaired. Uh, so there are a number of delisting criteria for BUI 14, which if met would mean that we would consider the beneficial use impairment no longer impaired. Uh, specifically, I'm going to focus on this one criteria on today, which is really that's related to coastal wetlands, uh, which is when habitat quality achieves an integrated ranking of good or better based on the IBI scores for water quality, submerged aquatic vegetation, aquatic invertebrates, fish and birds, or when the quality of wetlands in the AOC are shown to be comparable to reference wetlands outside of the AOC. Next slide. Oh yeah, and I just wanted to highlight that our group specifically focuses on the, uh, the water quality, submerged aquatic vegetation, aquatic, aquatic macroinvertebrate and marsh bird component of these wetlands. So we leave the fish side of things to the to Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Next slide. So shifting over to our methodology. Uh, so our crew goes out and we sample six coastal wetlands situated inside the AOC and three wetlands situated on Lake St. Clair outside of the AOC. Uh, and I think it's worth noting that two of the three wetland, the, the non-AOC reference locations that we call them, um, they're actually part of the St. Clair National Wildlife Area. Uh, which are some of the more pristine wetlands in the region. So we really are setting the bar fairly high. And I will say, I'll just add one more thing, which is that um, we do other work in the region, like for example, some of the some of the sites that uh, that Jake 
mentioned, we've done some sampling and monitoring there for a number of years in the past. I'm not going to be talking about that today, but we've we've collected some data on those as well. Next slide. Okay, so once we get to these sites, our monitoring protocol involves collecting data on different geophysical and biotic components of these wetlands. So like I mentioned before, uh, that includes water quality, submerged aquatic vegetation, aquatic macroinvertebrates, and marsh nesting birds. So we monitor water quality because it really is the foundation of wetland health. Uh, we survey submerged aquatic vegetation because it's an important component of habitat for many fish and wildlife species like birds, turtles, and frogs. Uh, likewise, aquatic macroinvertebrates are a food source for many species. Uh, they're also a good indicator of recent water quality because they're really sensitive to environmental change. Uh, and lastly, marsh nesting birds are also sensitive to disturbance and they give us a really good indication of the quality and quantity of available habitat. Next slide. And here is an example of what a sampled site actually looks like. I apologize if you can't differentiate the colors, but the 20 green dots, which are actually like in the, in the water part of the wetland, are locations where we conducted a submerged aquatic vegetation service. And that involves identifying all plants in a one by one meter quadrat and estimating the cover of each plant. Uh, the six blue dots, which are just kind of situated around the on the on the on the edge of the of the frag, the cattails there are uh, where we assess water quality, which involves taking measurements uh, using a multi-probe sonde and collecting water for laboratory analysis. Uh, the three larger dark green dots are where we sample inverts invertebrates, uh, which always correspond to one of the water quality stations. Uh, it involves using a net to sweep for and then collect 150 invertebrates per location. Uh, and then the seven red dots are where we would conduct bird surveys. So those are 15 minute point count surveys where we record all the birds seen or heard. And then that also includes a five minute call broadcasting period to encourage vocalizations from more secretive elusive species. And then once we actually collect all these data, what we need is a, a meaningful and kind of intuitive way to communicate the condition or the health of the marsh. Uh, next slide. So what we do is we take those parameters uh, that we collect and we summarize them into useful indices. So for example, we use a tool called the water quality index that combines measurements of uh, temperature, pH, turbidity, and conductivity. Uh, to characterize water quality. So I've provided a table here with a range of those water quality index scores, and those go from negative three to positive three. Uh, and there's the interpretation of those scores as well. But really the important thing to take from this slide is the difference between a good versus a degraded water quality score. It's basically the difference between the green and the red. Uh, so if you recall from earlier, I mentioned that the threshold for our delisting criterion is zero below which we'd say a water quality is degraded. So for values above zero, zero, we say that water quality is good, very good or excellent. Um, but in general, in the lower Great Lakes, you don't really see water quality index scores much higher than one. Next slide. So likewise, we also have indices that we use to summarize biological data which are called indices of biotic integrity or IBIs. So these IBIs, uh, essentially they combine different aspects of a given community. So for example, it could be the number of individuals of a certain species or the number of different species. Uh, and then that provides us an indication of ecosystem condition or health. So IBIs are slightly different from the water quality index in that their, their scores range from zero to 100, as you can see in the table there. Um, and, we, and in this case, we consider our threshold for a good score to be over 40. So that's our, that's our degraded, non-degraded threshold. Uh, next slide. And I can show you some results. So I'm just gonna spend a minute describing the figure because the next few slides all look kind of similar, but with different data. 
So on the left side of this graph, you'll see the, the y-axis is the water quality index score. And then at the bottom of the graph, you'll see the x-axis is the sampling year, and those go from 2011 to 2018. Uh, in each year, there's a, a green bar, or the bar on the left, which represents the average water quality index value for all six of the AOC wetlands that we sample. And then the blue bar, or the bar on the right, uh, represents the average for the three non-AOC sites that we sample. Uh, the red dashed line, like it's going through the middle of the figure there, uh, shows that threshold that we would consider to be good or better. Uh, so anything below that line, we would consider we would consider to be degraded. Uh, so you can see pretty clearly for all eight sample years, the green bars, which again represent the AOC average, remained above the red dashed line. Uh, and actually in, I think it's, yeah, seven of the eight years, uh, water quality is actually higher on average in the, A in the AOC uh, compared to the non-AOC wetlands. Next slide. Uh, so moving on to submerged aquatic vegetation. Uh, so this figure is very similar to the last one, but in this case, we have the index of biotic integrity on the y-axis instead of the water quality index. Uh, and then once again, the x-axis is the sampling year, uh, and then the red dashed line is our degraded uh, versus non-degraded threshold. Uh, the green bars, once again, indicate the average for the AOC, and then the blue bars indicate the non-AOC average. So in this case, uh, the AOC average for the SAV IBI for the AOC is generally lower than the non-AOC sites, but again, it is consistently above that threshold. So we would don't consider those to be degraded. Next slide. And now for aquatic macroinvertebrates. So uh, in this case, the average for the AOC was only higher than the non-AOC sites in one year. Yeah, just the one year, um, but it was extremely similar, nearly identical in three of the last four years of sampling. So 2015, 2017, and 2018, you can see those bars, the green and the and the blue bars are very, very close together. Uh, and again, like we saw with the other, uh, the other things we've looked at so far, they're all consistently above that threshold of 40. Next slide. And lastly for marsh birds. Uh, so once again, the AOC sites were only higher than the non-AOC sites in one year, but we're always above the threshold. So a lot of similar trends going on across these Across these different things that we're looking at, uh, and, and I'll and I'll just throw in. I think it's worth saying again. Uh, two of the three non-AOC sites are managed wetlands in the Saint Clair National Wildlife Area, so that non-AOC average really is quite the high bar. And that uh, yeah, that takes us to this question: uh, Has the delisting criterion for the beneficial use in Permit 14 uh, been met? Sorry about that, I forgot to say next slide. Uh, so next slide now. Next slide. Is that now working? Next slide after that one. Oh, there it goes. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so overall wetland condition for each of the habitat components can be described as good or better uh, in the St. Clair River AOC. So in all cases, we, in all instances, we were above that, that red dashed line. Uh, and they're reasonably comparable to non-AOC reference sites. Uh, beyond that, these habitat components consistently met these criteria for, uh, for eight years of the last eight years of consistent sampling, which taken together uh, means that the habitat components that we looked at here should not be considered impaired. Uh, the one caveat I will say is that we can't make an overall conclusion regarding the status of this delisting criterion without that, without that fish component. And uh, next slide. Just a few photos of our crew in the field. And next slide. Same thing there, the figure on the top left is what a submerged aquatic vegetation survey looks like. And next slide. 
And that's it. Uh, thanks everyone. Once again, I appreciate the opportunity to get to talk about it, talk about our work. Thank you, Joe. That's awesome. So we are now run at least, uh, we are not 8.30 when we thought we would be concluding, but I don't want to cut um, you know, people off. I don't want to kind of seal the opportunity for some questions because we do have a few. So I will leave it to the group. I understand that uh, people have other family commitments to, to get to. So I will leave it to the participants if you need to sign off. Thank you so much for taking the time to be um, with us thus far. If you are able uh, to um, stick around for another 10 to 15 minutes, um, we will conclude uh, within that time frame. We are gonna ask Myrna to also say a closing prayer, but we wanna get to a, a couple of questions um, before we close. So I'll just give uh, folks a minute to um, give that some thought. And if, if they want to um, close off, then, then they can. So I'm going to invite our panelists to uh, just click on your um, video momentarily so we can uh, direct some questions that we have. So I'll just let that. Unfortunately, um, Jake had to leave. So uh, yeah, he's unfortunately not going to be able to participate. But if it doesn't drain your bandwidth, if you can do it, if Aaron Clint, if you can just pop on your camera for a minute. We have a couple of questions. Okay, this one is for uh, Aaron. Aaron, um, there's a question about, are there other examples of projects where um, the CA has been involved either in, in or outside the AOC in recent years? Yeah, lots of projects. Uh, one that's coming up that I'm really excited about is at the uh, Keith McLean property. So that's uh, right near Rondo Bay. Uh, we are creating coastal wetland for spotted gar. So that's in, in process right now. Awesome. But lots of other ones too. We're working in, in field, in farm to put in berms and grass waterways. So uh, balancing farming needs with uh, meeting habitat and water quality improvement goals. Great, thank you. A question for Joe. Um, Joe, the, the graphs that you showed in terms of uh, water quality, macroinvertebrates and SAV for each of the sites, is there a graph available for each um, location? Yeah, there definitely is. So we, yeah, we put out a report after every uh, sampling year that we do. So I think the most recent one was a, it's a couple years old now, but um, I, I think it's on the, the St. Clair AOC website. Uh, there is, in, in that report, there's an appendix that has a breakdown of each individual site that we sample and uh, each one of these uh, metrics that we look at across the years for all the individual sites. Great, thank you. Um, Clint, this one is for you. It appears Swan Lake site, um, there's almost no Phragmites. What techniques or practices were the most effective? in uh, removing uh, Phragmites? Well, in fact, for that site, the Phragmites expanded. Um, unfortunately, it just, we didn't use a herbicide treatments at that site. We just cut, burned, um, and in some cases flooded where we could. Um, yeah, that's, there's no real way to control Phragmites really. Um, all you can do is do your best. You can try to manage it, but you have it's it's something that you have to be repeated year after year after year, and it gets costly. And um, Walpole had actually put a um, ban on, on using herbicide uh, in our marshes, so that um, prevented us from doing any of that type of work. Um, and another one for uh, Joe. Um, why do you measure um, submerged aquatic vegetation and uh, bugs in a wetland? What does that tell us? Uh, okay, so a bit about getting, I can probably spend a lot of time talking about this if I wanted to, but um, so for one, I think they're both extremely important components of coastal wetland ecosystems. So talk about submerged aquatic vegetation to simplify things, but from a, from a wetland function standpoint, aquatic vegetation stores and releases 
uh, nutrients, adds oxygen to the water through photosynthesis, um, provides stability to the sediment, which reduces turbidity. Uh, submerged vegetation provides spawning structure for adult fish, uh, refugia for larval and young fish. Certain turtle species uh, will, will prefer the warmer microclimate uh, foraging opportunities provided by submerged, uh, submerged aquatic veg. Uh, marsh dependent birds use aquatic veg for activities related to breeding and foraging. Uh, and then there have been a number of studies that have shown that wetlands with healthy uh, submerged aquatic communities support robust marsh bird communities. Uh, and that the condition of the submerged aquatic vegetation community is a really good reflection of watershed disturbance. So we can we can actually we can learn a lot. I guess is what I'm getting at by uh, by evaluating uh, submerged aquatic veg, and it's it's you know I think a lot of the same rationale applies to aquatic macroinvertebrates. All right, thank you um, for Aaron. Quick question about um, if there's information available to individual landowners that can help create or protect existing um, habitat. Yeah, so I, I would say pick up the phone, call St. Clair Conservation and tell us about your situation and what you're trying to achieve and uh, we'll do our best to help you out. So lots of different things you can do. Anything from uh, planting trees in your backyard, uh, increasing the amount of na native vegetation, so grasses and, and flowers, uh, to just not uh, mowing might be something that you could consider, or some of our bigger wetland projects if you have uh, the property that would support it. Great, thank you. And um, one last question for Joe. This is interesting. St. Clair River has had record high water levels over the past several years. Can you explain? if these levels are detrimental to wetlands and marsh birds, or are they helpful? Give me some tough questions here, Paul. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so lake, lake water levels, lake water levels naturally fluctuate over time, um, which ultimately really drives the structure of wetland vegetation. So in recent years, uh, it, in a lot of a lot of lower Great Lakes, especially, we've we've actually seen an increase in the number of many marsh birds, um, and that's likely the result of the creation of pools and ponds in those in that dead, dead really dense emergent vegetation, uh, which is like which is preferable for many marsh birds. Um, of course, with water levels can't they can't rise forever. Uh, if that happened, many wetlands would become flooded out, which would lead to a reduction in marsh habitat. And obviously that would be not so good for, for marsh birds. Um, but like I said, water levels naturally fluctuate and it already looks like water levels are trending are trending downward after those record high years. Uh, and if that continues, we'd expect to see some regrowth of those less competitive emergent plant species like arrowheads, uh, things like that, bulrushes, uh, and, and, then, and then eventually more, more habitat diversity overall, which is obviously a good thing for wildlife. Um, so I think, yeah, that, that like flooding, dewatering cycle in lake levels over different time scales is really what ultimately drives coastal wetland ecosystem diversity. Great, thank you so much. That's a great answer. Well, um, I, we, I am mindful of the time, it is 8.39, and I said I wouldn't keep people past uh, 10 to 15 minutes. So I really do want to, take a chance if I could uh, show my hands I would be uh, doing a big round of applause for our presenters tonight thank you again so much for really taking the time to put these slides together this is just really a drop in the bucket to uh, some of the the great work that's gone on by the conservation authority RLSN and uh, Walpole Island and other conservation partners within the creek and and really without um, I think Jake mentioned it and I was very remiss in not mentioning it myself, but really a lot of these projects would not have been possible without the um, critical support of private landowners down around in Mitchell's Bay who, who, um, who partnered with us to uh, do some restoration. And of course, I want to recognize all the, the, the funding partners, including Environment Canada, um, the Ontario Ministry of Conservation and Environment and Parks, and, and others, including um, uh, local industries and in, within the AOC. So I will 
turn it now over to um, Myrna to do a, a closing prayer. And uh, with that, Myrna, you have the floor to close this session. Thank you, everyone. And just a reminder that this session will be posted on our AOC website, which is uh, um, uh, friendsofstclair.ca. You will find it there, as, as, as well as other uh, resources on the AOC. So Myrna, over to you. And thanks again, everyone. Have a great night. This, this session has been, <clears throat> excuse me, I guess I'm like Jake. I have to cough every once in a while. This session has been both interesting and it's, it's really important to understand about the work that we're all doing together. I think that is one of the big uh, takeaways from this. We all carry, we all care about the earth. We all care about the water and all the plants and the animals that are depending on us to ensure that they will go on into the future. With that thought in mind, I'd like to close this session and offer these closing, this closing prayer. Abajuma Shomas, Ishkote Makasin Kwa, Indigenous Cause, Mondo Dem, the Kajanan and Dunjaba, Udawatami Odawa Nishnabi Kwa and Da, Miss Me, Medewan, Jimmy Gwachikajam Nado for this most beautiful day, this most wonderful life. Jimmy Gwach for all of the individuals who have listened to this, this uh, program today and all of those ones who presented their knowledge and their wisdom of how to help creation. I say Jimmy Gwach to you. Jimmy Gwach for all of those ones that are, are sitting in those places, all those ones who have walked on this creation before us. I say Jimmy Gwach to them for watching over us and helping us do the work to restore and expand the, the knowledge and wisdom of this creation. Help us with the natural laws. Help us work together as one heart, one mind, one body, one spirit, one soul, and one voice. I say to me, Gretch, to you for taking care of us this day and watching over us as we safely return to our families and our communities. I say to me, Gretch, to you all my relations. Aho, miigwech. Bamampi minwa. Thank you.